This is the Veterinary Project Podcast, episode 073. Welcome to the show created by vets featuring absolutely no pets. This is the Veterinary Project Podcast, hosted by Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Our resident veterinarians have swapped out their stethoscopes in favor of microphones to bring you the Veterinary Project Podcast, a show focused on real conversations aimed to connect this amazing profession full of remarkable people. Through the sharing of collective stories and wisdom and connecting over the many unique challenges we face, we invite you to join our community of veterinary professionals leading intentional lives. And now, here are the hosts of the Veterinary Project Podcast, Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Hey, what's happening, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Veterinary Project Podcast. Great episode, but first I have to start with a celebration because I just won a bet with Jonathan. I am going to be the proud owner of $50 worth of crypto altcoins, which I know nothing about. I don't even have a wallet set up yet to receive said coins, but they're on their way. So thank you, Jonathan. Oh, it's so funny that we're starting out the episode this way. <laughs> well, I mean, in the spirit of the episode, because I mean, we had a great conversation we with sure Gary did. Marshall. And, you know, in that conversation, we did talk about, you know, places that are unknown to you and getting new perspectives. And then you and I were, te- were chatting before we hit record about crypto. And I was like, let's just talk about it live because this is a new area for both of us. So here Completely. we go. Completely. I, I like it. I like your direction on that because it's true. It is new to both of us. Uh, I lost a bet. So Mike in his wallet, which has not been built yet, will have $50 worth of altcoins going in there. And if there's anything I've learned diving into the multiples of rabbit holes over the last two months, that is crypto. Wow. Is it exploding? And wow, am I excited for where it's going? Yeah. I mean, it's fun. Um, I know Isaiah Douglas at Vet Financial Summit. He's he's big on crypto and has been for years. So w- way ahead of, of you and I on knowledge base and, and being quick to the game. So we're going to track him down and try get a crypto episode for everyone sometime in 2022 here, just as we continue to learn, bring some of that knowledge to, to the community. Because I think at this point for a long time, I was very skeptical, right? Like Bitcoin, crypto, digital coins, like, no, this this makes no sense. And now I do think it is here to stay in some fashion. What that is, I still don't know. Well, and the rabbit holes I've gone down just to follow and and add to that is crypto as a whole general. There's so many different columns to go into, whether that is Web3, which we've just learned in the last few months based on Facebook's move into the metaverse whether it's, you know, going into degenerative finance, NFTs, all these pieces. And what I'm really excited about, Mike, is how does this relate to veterinary medicine? So if there's anybody in the space that is a listener of this podcast right now, please DM me, find me online. I'm really interested. And we've discussed this multiple times. How does this relate to the veterinary space? Because the blockchain will for sure. And I would put that, I just put it online. The blockchain and veterinary medicine will coincide at somewhere at some point in the very near future. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, coming from someone who is not very tech savvy, but I'm very interested. So I'm trying to get up to speed and learn, but it's fascinating. So yes, any actual experts, please reach out. We'd love to chat. Excellent. Well, that moves then into our quick tip, which you are maybe going to brush off. I don't know. And this one, this quick tip here. Just look at that. Totally See, I just it. earned it. Wow. You're just, you flip the quick tip all the time. Okay. Take it away, Jonathan. I'm happy to see <laughs> you have one. It must be phenomenal. because It is so- not phenomenal. You already know what it is. And this is a fun one. A couple months later is this is, I've been pushing Dr. Bug to go get himself a MetaMask wallet and or a crypto wallet to be able to store these digital items, whether it's an NFT coin, et cetera. For the listeners that may be so inclined on the technological end, look into it. It is called MetaMask. There is many YouTube videos. Beware, this is not financial advice, all the rest of it. But my quick tip today is go explore the space. Fantastic. By the time this episode airs, 
I will have my MetaMask, I think I'm saying it right, wallet. I will be set up to receive those 50 coins. You, I think you're going to have those 50 coins. We'll see what happens with them though. Okay. Yeah, they'll be worth nothing. No, I'm just... no. Okay, on with today's episode. It was a great one. I was, I've been looking forward to, to chatting with Gary for a long time. So it was so great to finally connect. Our guest today is Dr. Gary Marshall. Gary is a graduate of the Washington State University College of Veterinary Medicine. Dr. Marshall founded Island Cats Veterinary Hospital on Mercer Island, Washington in 1996. He still practices full-time at Island Cat, although he is no longer the owner. As the mentor slash coach for VetEx International representing North America, he connects with many students and new graduate veterinarians on a consistent basis. With his position as an adjunct professor for Washington State University's College of Veterinary Medicine, there are several veterinary students receiving part of their clinical training at Island Cats. Dr. Marshall is a past president of the Washington State Veterinary Medical Association and still serves on the board of directors. He also has previously served as vice chairman of the American Veterinary Medical Foundation and currently serves as one of two representatives from Washington State in the House of Delegates for the American Veterinary Medical Association. In 2020, he was appointed to the advisory group of the Commission for a Diverse, Equitable, and Inclusive Veterinary Profession. This is a joint venture of the AVMA and the AAVMC. At the end of 2020, Dr. Marshall was elected to the board of directors of the Women's Veterinary Leadership Development Initiative. He's really enjoyed working with the women on the board, and this experience has really helped him refine what allyship can and should look like. Gary wishes that he had more time to hike, create art through photography, accomplish a long list of home improvement projects, and consistently participate in his winter curling league. Enjoy this conversation with Gary, aka Mr. Incredible. It's a fun one. All right, Gary, very excited to have you on. I do feel like we have to open this episode with a disclaimer for everyone listening. I, I chatted with you only once already in our pre-recording. And I can already tell this conversation is going to get weird. So disclaimer <laughs> for everyone that's listening. <laughs> good, good. The weirder, the better. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for having me on both of you. Um, um, I love chatting with anybody and everybody. And I'm really looking forward to this. Yeah, likewise. And I can tell you are like a master connector uh, with, with yeah. talking to you just how much you care. I do want to, I mean, I opened with that intentionally because I want to jump back to your Instagram handle, because I love it. It's, yeah. it might get weird. And can you share that story to everyone about how you came up with that? Because I think it just fits your personality so wonderfully, oh. how you view the veterinary profession. Ah, oh, thank you. Yes, yes, because it is a, a strange handle. Um, so it, um, I'm also kind of a big uh, Pixar fan. And mm -hmm. Um, and I love the um, the Incredibles movies and just kind of that whole family story and um, and how they um, get into things. And there's one part, um, and I don't even remember which which villain right now off the top of my head, but the the town's getting destroyed, and Mr. Incredible is kind of uh, it's it's in the Incredibles too, where his wife is uh, has been sort of taking the lead, and she's in trouble, and the city's. Um, being ravaged. And so Mr. Incredible gets on the phone with his buddy um, Frozone and pretty much all he says is suit up, it might get weird. And then they both just get together and they go take on the, the city. And I, and, I, and I think that correlates kind of long story <laughs> into um, us in veterinary medicine when we, um, you know, when a lot of people are, are checking out or getting squeamish or whatever it is towards the things that we encounter in our profession that we put on our scrubs and we get in there and we go and and we just tackle it and whether it's um you know uh saving lives whether it's well-being whether it's um you know even on the, the the business side of things i think we um we suit up and it definitely might get weird and i and this was this is my handle way before the pandemic <laughs> And, and I think it just sort of proves out that, you know, whatever can happen will happen and we'll be there. Yeah. So good. Yeah, I love it. I, as soon as I heard that story, I saw your post. And then when we spoke, you explained it to me. 
And I was like, it's so accurate because I can just, I'm thinking of all these scenarios where you go running in and, you know, there's, there's dogs and people's arms and, you know, anal gland fluid or whatever it is, just a mishmash of stuff flying around. And it's like, it does get kind of weird in the vet clinic. Yeah. Yesterday um, I had a student in the clinic and, you know, it's like the first time she's been there, you know, for 15 minutes and trying to go in through stuff about how to get a fractious cat, you know, out of a cage, this cat, then we're just, you know, being calm with it and approaching it and scooping it up in my arms. And it just starts peeing down my leg, the cat, you know, and it's like, so I'm trying to impress this student about how, <laughs> how we got this all under control and it's just going to go fine. And then the cat just unloads on my leg. And it's like, okay, <laughs> that's how the day is going to go. And uh, it went fine from there, but uh, you know, that's, we never know how it's going to go and we just go with it. Yeah. Uh, could, couldn't say it better. I've got, to, okay. I'll be very brief in the story yesterday as well too. Same thing. Tech student. We're doing feline neuters yesterday, doing lidocaine blocks. First thing in the morning, go to do an open castration. So, and testicular juice shoots across the floor onto it. And we're, and I've never seen this in 12 years of practice, you know, actually six years being in practice the first time. And the tech students is like, is that normal? She's like, that shot four feet. <laughs> How do you keep that one G rated number two? How does this happen? And again, yes, you're 9 a.m. You have no expectations and welcome to another day in veterinary medicine. That's true. So true. Nice. Love it. Well, yeah, Gary, you have seen a lot. I mean, you're a, you're a 25 plus year veterinarian, you know, in practice. So you have so much wisdom to share, you know, maybe let's jump in. And I know, cause you, you're such a leader and an inspiration in this space you know, tell us a little bit maybe about your journey. And I know you were a business owner for quite a long time, you know, and you have a lot of pearls around leadership and then especially how that got magnified here as we went through the, the pandemic or are still in the pandemic. Oh boy. Um, yeah. Uh, I'll try to keep it short. And if there's anything you want me to expand on, go from there. Cause I'm not very good at keeping things short, but yes. Um, I actually started in the profession um, with my first job when I got my driver's license in, it was in the seventies um, and working at a clinic there, you know, very, very old school. My, my, my mentor, the owner, the only doctor at the practice, he, he graduated early fifties and fantastic mentor, really good experience. Um, you know, his wife was the practice manager, receptionist, all that kind of stuff, the, the classic um, story that you hear. So just work through that. And then, um, uh, when I graduated um, after a, a long, long haul, because it took me three tries to get accepted to vet school. Um, once I graduated a year later, um, bought his practice with another associate because he was ready to check out. Um, and uh, and so there was, you know, the two of us there, we'd hired an associate and then I wanted to branch out, but he was quite a bit older than me. So I wanted to start a satellite clinic and um you know, I, I wasn't necessarily a crazy cat person or anything like that, but it was a business decision to start a feline only practice just because of the, the niche at that time. It's everybody really likes their veterinarians. And in our community, if I'm going to start a practice and, and get people to come to my practice from the others, um, it had to be a little bit different. And it was also cheaper with space, with inventory, with staffing to start something with just one species. And I quickly realized that um, there's a lot of really, really good dog veterinarians, but there weren't too many of us, me included, that knew much about taking care of cats well and treating the clients, the owners of cats as pet parents, um, the way they wanted to be treated. And so it sort of um, started out as a business decision, but then it became a, I don't know, a, a passion, a calling. It's like, somebody's got to do this right. I might as well focus on that and do that. And I, and I sold my other practice um, to my associate, my, my partner, and, um, and then just has focused on cats. And as far as in the, in kind of the leadership space, um, I mean, I was, as a feline practitioner starting in the mid nineties and, um, uh, and most feline practices don't get that big, right? Because mm -hmm. it's, it's a smaller client base, smaller patient base. And um, so it's a, it's a solo practitioner practice for decades, you know, uh, the first 15 years or so. And got a family, got kids, um, busy wife. She's also a practitioner, well, a veterinarian. She doesn't practice now, 
Um, and, and life's busy. And, and it's, to be honest, it was really quite professionally lonely to be a solo practitioner before social media, before, you know, we're really connecting in any other way. And so until five or six years ago, when um, our um, uh, CEO of our state VMA asked me if I wanted to participate in, um, in a commission on cat decline sort of thing in our state and a position statement and that kind of stuff, just because I was the cat guy. Um, I hadn't really done, you know, anything outside of just busting my butt being a business owner and a practitioner and really caught the bug of, of, I mean, cause I've always liked to hang out with people. I'm an extreme extrovert, but really caught the bug in, um, leadership and, I think part of the reason that it's it's taken off some for me is because um, I look like the old white guy that's been doing it forever and must know what he's doing. But I I'm was so new to it that I was like the new grad, excited and asking all the stupid questions in the group of um, of all the people that have been sort of plodding along in it for years and years and years and just kind of in autopilot yep. and. Uh, and, and so I, I think it was just a little bit of a, I have no idea what I'm doing and I'm going to ask about it. And it's like, why aren't we doing it this way and that or that way? And, uh, and, and maybe that was a little bit of a, you know, just kind of a fresh idea coming in. Um, but that's sort of the, the history of the leadership journey to, to get to where I started being more involved. Nice, nice. So what, sorry, this is a little side tangent on here. What would you say yeah. fuels that excitement? Like how you described it, mm. you know, you, the excitement <laughs> of a new grad with experience. So what fuels that and keeps that going for you? Um, that's, that's, a, that's a really good question. I, 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 don't, I don't honestly know, but there's probably some positive um, feedback from some of the experiences I had. Um, classmate of mine, um, Rena Carlson is, has probably since we graduated, she's from Idaho and she started just working her way up in the Idaho, um, uh, uh, you know, sort of advocacy for the profession. And she's, um, worked her way up to the very high, you know, um, executive board for the AVMA. And she thought, oh, maybe Gary would be an, a good person to be on the, AVMF board, which is the American Veterinary Medical Foundation. So it's the philanthropy arm of the, the AVMA, giving out scholarships and disaster relief and, and access to care issues. And so I said, I don't, sure, I'll do that. And at the time, every other man on the board was a previous AVMA president. So super imposter syndrome, but also super welcoming and excited to have me there. And I'm, I'm not usually too timid about saying what I think and what I what I want. And so I think that positive feedback that I could be in this room with these people that have been doing this for so long and say, what if we do it this way? And getting people to say, hey, that's not a bad idea. Let's let's see where this goes and see what that rolls with it. And so it 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 gave me that sort of that encouragement from others to say, hey, yeah, let's, let's, let's do this. Um, thank you for your input and let's keep, keep going along. And I think I've taken that to try to, cause I'm not going to be around forever, right. To try to um, pull that out of a lot of young people. And that's where I get excited now is, is pulling people along, giving them an opportunity, connecting them with somebody that, that can help them. Cause I, it's not, it's not, that's not going to be me. I don't have that many really, I don't have that much cloud in any, <laughs> any arena I sit in, but I know people and then I can connect people. And, and that's what gets me excited now. I don't know if that answered your question, but. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I mean, I'm, it, it gives me a bit of clarity around it. I really like what you said, you know, the, the, what if we try it this way? Um, and you know what, this is probably a huge stereotype, but to not be stuck in, you know, patterns of, decades of repetition to be able to be like, wait a minute, there's new, there's other ways we can try things. So I'm, I'm really curious, you know, what you're seeing and especially with your work with sort of the newer graduates, like what are you seeing shift? And I, I know COVID mm. really amplified things, but around how we as a veterinary profession do things. Oh, um, 
Yeah, I think about that a lot because, uh, and I did uh, a little bit of post on this as far as on just the, the changes in the generations. And um, certainly, um, you know, we like to think that we're all the same and all this, but I, with, you know, whatever has molded and turns one generation into having certain stereotypes around, um, and I don't really like this word, but it, there, we could probably come up with a better word, but, you know, work ethic and um, uh, wellness and just how um, I was trained by in a previous generation that was in, you know, World War II. And it's just like, you just, you just work until your, <laughs> your knuckles are bleeding and you've defeated the enemy and, or whatever that is in your life to a huge shift to um, millennials that are like, Hey, I'm only going to survive if I take care of myself, if I focus on this and if I can't be um, healthy and happy and, um, and energized, I can't help anybody else. And then there's, um, you know, us current old timers, baby boomers in the middle that, um, that we either decide we're going to, you know, double down and be like our predecessors and say, you know, my way or the highway, or we're going to say, Hey, um, maybe I can keep doing this for a little while longer if I embrace these other ideas that are coming out. And so how do we bridge those, those generations and work together? Because, um, you know, I think that, that there's some good stuff um, that millennials can take from baby boomers and other generations, as opposed to just saying, you know, out with the old um, and totally vice versa. I mean, as, as you guys know, anytime you see somebody new and younger coming into the clinic, you just glean new things that are, that are just awesome. And it's like, why didn't I ever think of that? And, and so, um, so uh, I think that um, somehow bridging that gap between the generations, as opposed to making it more divisive, because there's so many things in our in our world right now. And I think COVID really amplified that, that are creating us to be more divisive than together. And so trying to figure out how to get back to there is, is I think the, gonna be the, the key to all of us working to bet together for the longest. If I may jump in with that, with a follow-up question, Gary, in following you from afar on social media and seeing your connections and inclusion with some of the younger generations that are out there, are there specific tactics that you've used and or conscious thought to bridging that gap in generations? Because I, I see you and it seems so relaxed and comfortable, both as a measure of your personality, but it seems further than that as well. Anything there you'd be able to share? Huh. That's um, well, thank you for that. And that's, that's tricky. Um, I think um, I think it's just being open to um, to everybody else's perspectives, and 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 focus on that um, uh, that making things better is going to take um, a a group that's not just like us. You know, that's going to be diverse in all aspects, age. Um, sex, gender identity, um, racial identity, um, experience, geography, all those types of things. The more we get those together and um, don't say, I don't like you because you're not the way I do, or you think the way I do, or you're from the way I do. It's like, I think this is awesome to learn something new uh, from somebody else's perspective. And how can we merge those together? Um, kind of that diversity bonus concept where, you know, one plus one equals three. If the if one, if the two ones are different things. Yeah, excellent. And, and I, that just, that just energizes me. Um, and I just love that stuff. Yeah. You nice. can tell it, it, it's neat seeing you in your element, like with some of the posts I've seen. And as you discuss it, um, let's continue down that path. Cause I know one of the things I've been following you for a while. And then there was a post that really caught my attention because I was completely unaware of it is you were on the board uh, for Wolvaldi. So that, that's a women leadership development initiative. Obviously, you're a man. And I, when I saw that, I was like, <laughs> this is really like cool and interesting. So, so tell us yeah. about that, like how that came to be, um, you know, and then what that looks like. Yeah, it might get weird, right? 
Let's get weird. Yeah. Let's get weird. <laughs> I mean, what the heck? Why am I there? Um, and why? Why me? And I. Yeah, maybe you should ask some of the uh, the other women on the board um, why that that um, came to be. Um, uh, and and I some of it, and I think we'll probably come around here. We talked about it a little bit before the the show on just on allyship. I mean, I really never knew what that meant, but. Um, when, um, uh, well, I, I always tell stories, right? So I'll wrap it around to a story. I think that that might help and stuff. So before the pandemic, it was probably 2019 um, uh, at a conference, Western here in Vegas. And um, I saw that um, there was going to be a, a meeting of uh, Danielle Lambert and her snout school, and she was getting a bunch of people together. And, and uh, Danielle and I had talked about some other stuff before. So I, I knew her, but I didn't, I didn't really know much about her leadership stuff. And so I just had heard that they're having their meeting at this bar at this time, and they're going to get together. And so um, I showed up and I was the only guy, you know, every, everybody. And, you know, it's like, I don't know if it was intentionally supposed to be just women or that's what that affinity was for that group. And so I just, I just started, you know, chatting with people and, and uh, meeting people there. And I think some were looking at me like, who's this guy, you know, kind of crashing our party. And others were like, okay, you know, why should we not um, let this guy hang out with us and that kind of stuff. And, um, and one of the one of the people there um, was Laura Pletz, who's the going to be the the president of Waldi. This Waldi is starting in January, and I mean we talked for just a few minutes, um, but then um, you know like nine months later, I get a call. It's like we you know we really appreciate you um, speaking up for us, stepping up to the plate to be beside us, and we just have seen you um, join along with helping whether it's women or whether it's anybody else. And we'd love to have you um, apply to be on the board. And so it's like, oh, okay. I, I mean, it was not on my radar at all. And, um, you know, I'd gone to their breakfasts at conferences and things like that, but it was just pretty much to support them. Um, and so I applied, I have no idea how, how I, I, I just went through the process of seeing the, uh, people that are applying for the board this year, because now it's been one year, and it's like, I, I, I don't know how I <laughs> ever get voted on now with the caliber of the women and what they've done um, that are that are, we're applying this year. But um, it's been such a wonderful group for me as far as so welcoming, so encouraging. Um, and again, one of those groups where um, I definitely have imposter syndrome. Um, being around them and 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 with these women in that space and wondering if I'm going to put my foot in my mouth or if I'm going to overreach and be that typical, you know, man in the room that feels like that's where the leadership's supposed to go. Even even today, that that seems to to be there. So I've pretty much just this year just tried to tried to listen, um, but they've been you know really really open to any thoughts that I that I have um, and. Uh, and I think that's where that kind of that allyship comes in. I'm just kind of learning what that means, not because I'm trying to be an ally, but I'm just being being myself and being alongside and, and trying to learn from others. Mm -hmm. So it's been fun. Yeah, for those great. that may not be familiar with its mission and or its goals, can, mm -hmm. are you able to briefly summarize yeah. what the goal of this initiative and group is? Yeah, yeah. It, um, it was started in, uh, well, they started thinking about it in 2013, okay. a couple women um, that were involved with AVMA. It's very closely associated with AVMA here in the States. Um, and uh, they felt that, you know, they'd been putting in all the time and they were capable, but there were hurdles to them getting into the upper levels of leadership within the AVMA. And so they wanted to start this to uh, train leaders, uh, you know, speaker training, leadership training, um, be a group to identify and um and elevate those in their communities to to being leaderships in their community advocacy groups you know state vmas and all all that kind of stuff or wherever and that's really been happening over these last you know seven eight years it's been um you know at the 
um, the president-elect of the AVMA is a woman. We've got the CEO of the AVMA as a woman. Um, gosh, most of the reference committees for the AVMAs are led by women now. And it's um, and so there, there really is a seat at the table. And so now that's shifting and the times have changed, right? As far as just social media and how we get things out there and how we, um, um, how we change our structure. Um, and so this last year and into this next year, a lot of our focus on different um, presentations, panels, that kind of stuff is um, elevating a lot of the different affinity groups, um, you know, as far as with uh, Pride VMC, with Latinx VMC, with other groups um, that, um, so trying to, um, I don't know if it's necessarily help them because they're, you know, they got a lot going on and they can do that, yeah. but as far as elevating them, making those connections, um, saying, you know, just because there's nobody that looks like you in leadership now doesn't mean that that's not going to be the case in a few years. And so that's that's kind of the shift um, that's going on now. What that looks like and how we do that the best, don't quite know yet, but um, that's the focus. Good question. Thank you for asking. Well, thank you for sharing very much. Mm -hmm. Gary, for, for people that um, allyship is maybe new to them, like maybe they're hearing it, that term for the first time or, it's, or very recently, what would you say, like, how, how does someone step into that? Like going from, mm. you know, ground zero, take their first step, like what tactically, you know, how would you head down that path? <laughs> I'm not very tactical or cookbook kind of guy. I, I just, uh, I just, I'm just nosy and curious. And so for my <laughs> path, for my path to that is, um, I'm just interested in, in what drives people and where they're where they are and where they want to go. And then if there's a way that I can say, oh, I know this person that's done something like this, let's, let's, uh, let's connect um, those dots together and see if, um, if we can um, plot a course where you can get to where, um, where you want to be. And it's, um, and I think the older I get and the more I do with this, I, I realize just how tremendous um, privilege that I've had growing up um, male in, uh, you know, in North America. And, and the more I'm nosy and curious with, with people that I, that I meet and um, I'm not shy about asking them questions, um, I find out that, um, that that certainly is not the case for for so many people, um, and and I think that's um, and I don't have you know I don't have a platform to to change that. But if there's a way we can um, at least make it known and um, and give those that are that are awesome and that would be fantastic leaders a chance somehow to, to show that as opposed to just there's too many doors shut. Um, if, if that's what allyship looks like to me is just like, Hey, um, let's, let's try to, you know, open doors, lower hurdles. If we're, if somehow some of us are in the way. Yeah. Man, it's funny when you, when you said that, I was just thinking like, I went down a bit of a wormhole yesterday on, unconscious bias right mm. and the whole point with that is is it's unconscious so you don't know that you're being biased in whatever it is so i think when like i would counter argue you and say like you do have the platform because you know someone listening to this it may not even be on their radar so just by like step one bringing awareness to it you know i think is a great start because you're obviously doing that because it's catching you know so many people's attention Oh, thank you. I, I, I hope so. It's definitely not a, um, I, I, I just do what I can. I don't anticipate that, you know, I don't, I, I don't know. I appreciate it. I don't know what to say that, but no. thank you. No, that's all good. Okay. Well, I guess let's maybe bring it, bring it back around. Um, you know, you, you have so much experience with your clinic ownership. I know you recently got out of ownership. You had talked about being in a multi-vet practice now down to one, I mean, what, where are we at like present day and how are you, you know, navigating sort of your life and where do you maybe see 2022 
in the veterinary <laughs> profession. I don't know if Mr. Incredible has a crystal ball, but I suspect <laughs> he does. Oh no, it's definitely no crystal ball. I'll just keep showing up and 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 seeing seeing uh, what happens. Um, yeah, I've uh, owned my cat practice now for 25 years, and uh, you know, back when uh, when I was going to school and and being kind of that baby boomer, and I think even a lot of Gen X mentality, it's like we we're we're become vets. We we practice. We're supposed to be a clinic owner. And so we do that and that kind of stuff. And I don't know that I was ever supposed to be, or I was ever the best clinic owner. That's for sure. Um, those types of, um, you know, the, the dollars and the graphs and the, um, margins and that kind of stuff was never anything that I, that I enjoyed. So it was just kind of like a vehicle for me to be able to practice in. And that's what everybody said I was supposed to do. So probably, you know, would have been, maybe happier in life if I sold and was an associate 10 years ago, as opposed to, um, uh, you know, waiting until the, until a pandemic. But, um, but I did want to, and I did want to sell to an associate for, um, for, I, I think lots of reasons um, to kind of uh, feel that I could pass, you know, pass the torch off to somebody that a, a mentee that I, that could, take it over and keep it going the same way that it was the same family feel and all that kind of stuff. And, um, and that just never materialized. And then with um, uh, connections that it had and plans going forward with that with an associate, um, once the pandemic hit, um, it was uh, pretty close to impossible to have that happen on a lot of different levels, both the, the scared, um, I don't know if I should be a to this associate, I, I don't know if I should be a, a business owner um, anymore. I don't know if I can survive it. And at that time, also, as far as you know, would anybody give me money to 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 for a loan to buy a practice? And so that fell through once again. But also, I think at the time it was like I was more resolved to like I don't I've, I've done this long enough. I don't want to be the practice owner anymore. And so um, and the and you know the money is so much better with a corporation selling to a corporation. Um, so that's where we went. And then just earlier this year, ended up selling to a, um, a smaller um, corporation, Western Veterinary Partners. Um, and they've been, they've, they've been good to me. Um, it's not, it's certainly not the same. It's different. I've, I've, for my associates that I've had in the past or for myself, I never had a contract. Um, until this year. And so learning the ins and outs of how to work within those, um, those settings um, is, is new to me and different. Um, and going forward, and, and so um, as, as so many other practices, you, you brought this up as far as, yeah, I'm a solo practitioner again now, not by choice, um, but um, that for a million different reasons, um, uh, so many people have left our profession and that has happened here, here as well, um, or, or moved or just shifted or done something else. I, I have, <laughs> I'll tell you one story about one, uh, staff member. It's like, you know, you hear about people, oh, I'm just going to get out. I can't take it anymore. This is that. And again, it might get weird, right? I have one staff member who, um, she came to work with us because of COVID, because her previous like art business, um, dried up during COVID, you know, she was doing art classes and other stuff. And she's like, oh, I'm going to, I love cats. I'm going to go work in the cat industry. Happy to take you. Come on in and work with us. She was fantastic. And then she, um, she said, oh, this TikTok thing, I'm going to, uh, she started a video um, of her cat playing in a, like a ball pit that she had a little kid's ball pit. Um, now she has a million followers. She's totally sponsored. She could quit <laughs> quit work and just be a, a TikTok uh, inspiration or whatever. So it's like, how do you, you I, I would have never, I don't have a crystal ball that I could have <laughs> predicted that happening. But I mean, there's just so many reasons why people are moving around. And, uh, and I think that's going to keep, keep going. Yeah. Um, but I'm optimistic for the future. I think the trend in like so many that are moving on to be their own bosses with becoming relief vets because they don't like what they've what they've had so far. I think that's probably, if I were to say, this is my crystal ball, I would say, give that a few years. Those individuals are gonna, 
going to want to be part of a family again uh, as a part of a clinic. And they will have sampled many, many clinics and say, that's what I like. That's what I don't like. And they'll gravitate somewhere and they'll become part, part of that family and we'll have less relief vets, but we'll have more solid teams um, that will work together and go forward. And that's what I hope. And, and, um, and that's happening at our clinic with a, um, at the beginning of 2022, we do have an associate coming on who has been a relief vet for us for, um, you know, uh, this year, um, off and on and a relief for quite some time. And um, I think she's decided that, you know, um, going to work at one place with this team that we have here um, looks like it's a pretty good deal. And, and she's, she's, um, nobody's as old as me, but she has been doing it for, you know, a decade or more. And she's like, you know, I, I think I like this all cat stuff where I don't have to wrestle with Great Danes and Akitas and stuff anymore. So, um, so I think we're going to be seeing that over the next few years, a shift back into um, building up families and veterinary clinics again, instead of dispersing um, to the winds. I, like I love that. that comment, Gary. I'm also optimistic that that is the case. And, and uh, I think it's better for those. Well, again, personal opinion only when you're on your own, it can be lonely as you spoke about mm -hmm. previously going to yeah. all those different clinics as a relief that you are not officially part of that team and it's difficult. And I, yeah. I am optimistic to your end discussion there as well. Yeah. Good, good, good. Okay, Gary, before we uh, wrap up and go into our impact round, I have one more question for you. I'm trying to keep it as weird as I can. I've never asked this question before. So in the spirit, oh, gosh. Mm. <laughs> in the spirit of, you know, stepping into things you don't know with your, with your sort of wealth of knowledge, my question is what have I forgot to ask you that mm. I should have asked you? Oh boy. That's a hard one, Michael. It is. I'm sorry um, for putting you on the spot. I didn't give you any prep on that, but I was just sitting here thinking like, you know, you have so much experience and you're in so many arenas. There's obviously something that's just not on my radar. I think um, one thing you haven't asked, and I think you do, you have asked others maybe this, is what do you do when you're not a veterinarian? It's coming. Yep. Oh, is that, is that, is that coming up? <laughs> or is that the on, question? We touch on, it, yet. We touch on it, but not in depth. So let's true. go. Yeah, let's go true. there. What, what does Mr. Incredible do when the, when the suit is off? Well, lately I, I kind of come home <laughs> and sit on the couch <laughs> and watch a, watch binge a show for a little bit, just oops. And things are falling off the desk. Um, uh, just because it has been, been super, super tiring, but the things that I want to be able to do more of is, um, I love travel. Um, we haven't been doing a whole lot of that lately and, um, kind of my, my passion outside of internet medicine is kind of staying in touch with an artistic side. Um, I love landscape photography and getting out we've got so many places here in the northwest like you guys do in canada to um get out and just beautiful um scenery and get you know off the grid and no um no interactions with <laughs> with social media or emails that kind of stuff and just focus on how can i compose an image that's going to uh, be favorable. And a lot of it's just luck because of the weather changes and the light and all that kind of stuff. But getting your, I like getting my brain to be able to kind of focus on something else that's completely different than what I do in, you know, problem solving at work and in mentorship and all those kinds of things. Love it. Yeah, that's amazing. It's a such a skill too. My wife has that skill where we'll be walking along the river and she'll just stop and she'll be like, quick, look at this. And I'm like, I have no idea what you're looking at. And then she takes a photo and it's just beautiful. And you're like, I didn't see that at all, but like you yeah. captured it perfectly. Oh, oh, yeah. That's fun. Okay. Right on Gary. Okay. Well, as we wrap up here, we're going to move you into our impact round. I feel like the first question is a slam dunk. Are you a cat <laughs> or a dog person? Gotta say, gotta say cat person. Uh, love cats. I love dogs too, but cats. Nice. Nice. True or false? I knew I wanted to be a veterinarian since I was a kid. True. Nice. How would your friends describe what you do for a living? 
I think it depends on which friends. I think most of them that aren't part of veterinary medicine would just say, oh, he, he must just play with cats all day. And those friends that don't like cats, and you know that there's those, it's just like, they just have no idea why I would want to like spend my day with cats and people. But yeah. What is your favorite hobby? I'll go back to um, photography. Um, love to get out there. Second for the Canadians in the room is uh, curling, but I don't get to do that quite as much uh, just with, with busyness, but we're starting back up. Curling links are going. Yeah. Nice. And that's a good hobby too, because you can do that, you know, forever because it's, you know, very technical skill, but not, not super hard on the body. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look at the American curlers. They all got beer guts, right? And they won the Olympics. <laughs> what in this world are you most grateful for? Uh, yeah, I'll have to say family, both immediate, extended, you know, professional, and uh, and just friendships. Those those that be become family, definitely family. Nice. Okay, Gary, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I was I'm really looking forward to this one. It's been great connecting with you, and you can tell you just have that gift, like you are a super connector. So so thank you for joining us here today. You bet. My pleasure. Yeah. There's, there's going to be people listening that, that want to either reach out or follow along. If so, where would be the best uh, place that we can direct them? Definitely Instagram. I, I only have enough bandwidth for one social media platform. So I just stay there. And that's at, at it might get weird with uh, periods between the, the words. Nice. And we'll drop that in the show notes. So, and sorry, quick tangent. So you're, you are not going to be taking a run then at becoming a TikTok million plus influencer. <laughs> no, that's not on my, no, I don't think the world wants to see that. <laughs> yeah. All right, Gary. Well, it was great having you. As always, we always wrap up the show. The last word goes to you. What message do you want to leave for the veterinary community? Oh, thank you for that. And thanks for having me. This has been really, really good. And gosh, the time has flying, flown by. Um, and, uh, and I love chatting. The parting words I would say is optimism. And what I mean by that as far as optimism for the future is I had a little bit of a taste this last weekend at being at a conference that, um, and pandemic did so much stuff. But one of the things that it, it I, I'm realizing that it did is that it, um, physically separated all of us. And we're not meant for that as a, as a species and as a, as, you know, human beings and, um, getting back together at a conference and meeting people that I only knew online or seeing people that I hadn't seen in years and being able to go out for a beer or, you know, take a walk or sit in a conference to get in a, in a lecture room together and talk about the, the lecture, as opposed to just being a, a square on a screen, um, over zoom, which we've adapted amazingly. But being able to do that with people, you know, in proximity around a table, I think everybody that was there, you ask everybody that we, that we, you know, interacted with or that was at that conference, and they would say, I am just so jazzed for the future. And that we got together, we talk about issues, but we also talk about how we can, you know, see those issues coming around and what we can do together um, as a profession, there's so many people that really want to make that change. So that's what I'm optimistic about is getting back together, take those opportunities when you can to go to a conference, to see your colleagues in person, besides just the ones you work with and, and it will make a difference and we'll get through this. Thank you for listening to the Veterinary Project Podcast. As a recap, on behalf of our hosts, the Veterinary Project Podcast will be releasing new episodes weekly. So be sure to tune in as we bring you more conversations aimed at helping you enjoy a life well lived. If you enjoyed what you heard on the show and you want to stay in the know, please like, love, and or subscribe to the podcast on the listening platform of your choosing, as we're available on all the usual suspects. If you know of others that may benefit from these conversations, we'd love it if you please share the show with them, as this will help us grow our community to reach more and more veterinary professionals. Speaking of which, if you are a veterinary professional and would like to get connected with more like-minded individuals who are joining us on this journey, please send an email to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com, and we'll invite you to be a part of our private Facebook group. 
general feedback, request for information, or perhaps request to be a guest on the show can also be sent to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com. Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light, thank you for listening to the show, and we'll catch you again next week for another episode of the Veterinary Project Podcast. Bye for now. Bye for now.